here is what I want from a pizza. I want a very thin and very crisp crust. I don't want chubby dough on the edges that people leave on the sides of their plates. And I want my crust brown, but not black. I know that to some people a charred pizza is the real deal, but to me that's just burnt. Oh, and one more thing. I don't like the bottom to be covered with semolina or flour. The first one tastes gritty and the second one tastes dusty. So I have a feeling that what I'm making today is not a pizza altogether. How is this not a pizza? I don't know yet, but I'm sure I'll find out in the comments. Here's what I love about this recipe. Not only does it taste glorious, but it's easy and accessible. No need for a wood-burning pizza oven or a specialty flour. You will need a pizza stone or a pizza steel if you want to bake it in the oven, but grilling without a stone is also an option. My dough is based on Rose Levy Berenbaum's recipe. She developed a no-knead pizza dough before no kneading was a thing. If you want a very thin pizza and you don't care about that puffy ring of dough with, the, with no toppings on the edges, kneading is counterproductive. The more you knead, the more gluten you'll develop and the more your dough will resist stretching. That's why Store-bought dough often acts like a rubber band. You try to stretch it thin, but it springs right back. If you don't need your dough, stretching it thin is actually quite easy. I like to make my dough one to five days in advance. This helps it develop more flavor, makes it easier to shape, and takes all the guesswork out of how long it should rise. Whether your kitchen is 65 degrees or 85 degrees, you can follow the same procedure. Before you make the dough, you should prep your containers. You don't want to do it when you are up to your wrist in the sticky dough. We are making two pizzas today, so for each one I need a container that is roughly two cups in capacity. Place each one on the scale and pour 10 grams of olive oil into each container. This is the oil we'll use for stretching our pizzas. I think it's way tastier than flour. How much oil you use depends on your shaping skill. I prefer 14 grams of oil, but I've noticed that my students have an easier time shaping with slightly less. Of course, for many of them it's their first pizza, so once you're comfy with 10 grams, you can try a bit more. Now let's make the dough. Put 226 grams of unbleached all-purpose flour into a medium bowl. Add one teaspoon of SAF instant yeast or one and a quarter teaspoons of active dry yeast, one teaspoon of granulated sugar and the correct amount of salt for your salt type. I'm using two teaspoons of diamond crystal kosher, but I realize that many of you are working with completely different salts. Mix your dry ingredients together for about 30 seconds. Make a well in the middle and pour in 158 grams of water that is somewhere between 70 and 90 degrees. If you don't have a thermometer, think pool water, not a hot tub. Start working in the flour from the sides using a spoon. It's okay to be pretty aggressive and work the flour in fairly quickly. When the dough becomes too hard to mix with a spoon, clean it out and continue by hand. Fold the dough toward you and rotate the bowl with the other hand. Keep going like this until all the flour is absorbed. Anytime you encounter sticking, scrape off your hand and dunk it into the flour that is sitting around the walls of your bowl. The less flour you have left in the bowl, the more brisk you should be when touching the dough. If there is no more flour left and the dough is evenly sticky everywhere, you're done. See how shaggy my dough is? This is definitely not the smooth bowl you'd be looking for when making bread. Cut the dough in half with a pastry scraper. Wet your hands to prevent the dough from sticking and very briefly roll each piece into a bowl and place into the containers with oil. Oil the back of your fingers and gently press down on the dough to flatten it out. You don't want to knead the oil into the dough. All the oil should stay on the outside. Cover with a lid and let's sit at room temperature for 45 minutes. Then refrigerate overnight or up to five days. If you want, you can mark where your dough was when it first went into the containers. This way you can see if it doubles by the next day, though it should be pretty obvious even without a mark.
If you have a stand mixer, the process is even faster. Mix all the dry ingredients, fit the mixer with a paddle attachment, and run it on low speed while pouring in the water. Increase the speed slightly and run until most of the flour is absorbed. Stop the mixer, lift the head or lower the bowl so that the dough gets slightly redistributed. Scrape down the sides and turn it on again for a few seconds just until all the flour is absorbed. With a damp hand, remove the dough that's stuck in the beater and give your dough a couple of folds to form a ball. It will be very sticky, so re-wet your hands as needed. Divide the dough into two pieces and roll each one into a rough ball. I prefer to make my sauce a day ahead too, but as long as you cool it completely before using, you can certainly make it the day of baking. Put one diced yellow onion and two tablespoons of olive oil into a pot. Season with salt and set over medium heat. Cook stirring occasionally until the onion is translucent and golden brown. I like to add a pinch of chili flakes at some point during the cooking process. It gives the sauce a slight warmth that's very pleasant. Once the onions are translucent, add two minced garlic cloves and continue to cook until everything is golden and just starting to brown. Add 750 grams of chopped or crushed canned or boxed tomatoes. The exact measurements are not important here at all. I'm using 750 grams because that's the size of the box my tomatoes come in. Add half a cup of dry white wine, though that's optional. Since I'm using unsalted tomatoes, I'll add a pinch of salt, but if yours are salted, don't salt them yet since the sauce will reduce a lot. Bring to a simmer and cook over moderate heat until very thick. I can't tell you how long this will take because it depends on the size and shape of your pot and your exact heat setting, but mine took about 30 minutes to go from this to this. There is no need to stir it until the sauce gets very thick. Take off heat to cool till warm. Puree with an immersion blender or whatever machine you want to use. You don't want a silky smooth puree. Your sauce should still have a bit of texture, but no big pieces. Taste it and add salt as needed to make it very intense. Mine didn't need any additional salt. What I put in the beginning turned out to be good. Keep in mind that you'll be spreading a very, very thin layer of sauce on your pizza. So if your sauce is not a serious flavor bomb, you'll have a bland pizza. This amount of sauce will be enough for four pizzas. The leftover sauce is delicious on pasta, shrimp, fish, and pretty much anything. The next day, set a pizza stone or steel on the bottom rack of your oven and preheat it to 500 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. Some ovens need even longer, so if your first attempt at pizza doesn't come out crispy, preheat for a full hour. The cheese that I like to use is whole milk, low moisture mozzarella. Fresh mozzarella is super wet and is not really appropriate for this style of pizza. I know you can buy mozzarella already shredded, but 90% of the time it will be coated with so much cellulose that it will not taste good after melting. So it's best to buy your mozzarella in one piece and shred it yourself. I really like Calabro brand, but I'm not sure if it's available everywhere in the US or just in the New England area. Buying mozzarella can be somewhat tricky because the low moisture ones don't always say that on the package. So I usually go by the process of elimination. If it's in water, it's definitely fresh. If it's in a thin plastic wrapper like this one and you don't see the words fresh mozzarella on the package, it's probably low moisture. By the way, it's fine if it has some marketing BS like made from farm fresh milk, <laughs> as long as it's the milk that's fresh and not the mozzarella that's fresh, it's good. One pound of mozzarella will make about four pizzas. Place a piece of parchment paper on your work surface. Dislodge the dough from the sides of the container with your fingers. Plop it into your hand. Pour the remaining oil into the middle of the parchment and place the dough in the middle of the parchment 
oily side down. Shimmy it around to make a slightly bigger circle of oil. It's normal for the olive oil to solidify slightly, especially if the dough was in the fridge for a few days. Scoop it out with your fingers and draw a circle with the soil around your dough to make roughly an inch and a half border. Leaving the periphery of your parchment unoiled will help the dough grab onto the paper and stay thin instead of sliding back down toward the center. With flat oiled hands, pat the dough flat. Instead of thinking of the step as stretching, think of it as patting and thinning. Make sure your hands are flat so that you don't poke holes in the dough. Try to work on all parts of the dough evenly. If you notice that one part is becoming thinner than the other parts, leave it alone and work on the thicker parts. If you get a hole, don't worry about it. It will taste just as good with a hole as it will without a hole. <laughs> but you can avoid holes by using flat hands and keeping the dough even. A common mistake is to stretch from the center, which results in the middle being too thin and the outside too thick. Try to avoid that and pat the outer parts flat to thin them out. My pizzas are never round because the parchment paper is rectangular and not square, so for me to stretch the dough as thinly as I like, I have to shape it into an oval. Yes, it's normal for the dough to shrink a bit when you stop stretching. Wait for it to stop, then evaluate if it's the thickness you want. If you want it thinner, work on it some more. When I'm working on it, it feels like an eighth of an inch or three millimeters, but after I stop, it jumps to about four millimeters. With a bit of trial and error, you'll find the thickness that you like. Okay, I think this looks good. Spread a thin coating of sauce on the pizza. To give you a rough idea of how much I measured it, and it looks like I use about half a cup. But of course, that will depend on the size of your pizza. I like to spread my sauce very close to the edges. Then sprinkle on the cheese. This is again something you'll have to experiment with to find the amount that's right for you. Depending on which parchment paper you use, you might or might not have an issue with the corners turning black and crumbly in the oven. This parchment paper will be fine. The corners will darken but won't burn. But if you're worried about it, wipe the oil off the edges with a paper towel and trim the corners with scissors. By the way, it's very important that you don't get any oil or toppings on the underside of the parchment paper. They can seep into your pizza stone and stink up your kitchen every time you use the stone since the stones are porous and it's impossible to wash anything off them. Put the pizza on a peel or a rimless baking sheet and slide onto the stone, parchment paper and all. It will slide very easily, so don't push too hard. Try to do this quickly so that you don't lose the oven heat. Bake for seven to eight minutes. I don't like to use the convection fan for pizza since it tends to burn the cheese on top. The pizza is done when the bottom is brown and crisp. Yes, you should lift the dough and check before pulling the pizza out. To get the pizza out of the oven, place the rimless baking sheet on the stone, grab both the pizza and the parchment and drag onto the sheet. Slide it onto the cutting board and pull out the paper. I'm kicking myself now that I didn't record the sound of cutting it on a good mic, but here it is on a bad mic. <laughs> As Chef John says, fork don't lie. Thin crust, check. Crispy bottom, check. Nicely browned edges, check. I know this pizza defies categorization. It's not Neapolitan, it's not New York, it's Rose Levy Berenbaum plus Helen Rennie. If you haven't tried it, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Here are some questions that I get about pizza in my classes. Can I make the dough the day of baking? Yes, it will take somewhere between one and a half to three hours to rise depending on the temperature of your kitchen. Can I double or triple the recipe? Absolutely. If you're making the dough by hand, I suggest you don't mix more than four pizzas at the same time. If you're mixing with a mixer, my four and a half quart bowl can handle four pizzas and my seven quart bowl can do up to eight. Can I divide the dough after rising? Yes, you can. If you're making six pizzas and you don't have six little containers, you can lightly oil one big bowl and let the dough rise in bulk. Then put a piece of foil on the counter, oil it and plop the dough onto it. 
cut it into six pieces and that's your pizzas. You'll need to pour 10 to 14 grams of oil onto each parchment paper when shaping and you probably won't end up with round pizzas. I usually end up with rectangular ones when I cut it, but they taste just as good. Can I freeze the dough? You can, but it won't taste as good. Also keep in mind that you'll need to remember to move the dough from the freezer to the fridge the day before making the pizza, so there is still some planning involved. Given the fact that the dough procedure takes 10 minutes and you have five days of flexibility of when to use the dough, I really don't think that freezing is worth it. What do I do if my crust is soggy? If your crust is soggy, here's what you can try. Preheat the oven longer. Some ovens need a full hour. Get a pizza steel. Steel's brown better than stones. Make sure you are not using too many toppings. For some toppings, it might even be a good idea to pre-bake the dough empty until it's just set. Then get it out, top it, and finish baking it. How can I prevent my cheese from browning? I don't mind my cheese slightly brown. If your cheese doesn't taste good, the problem might be that you are buying it already shredded and it's covered in cellulose. That being said, here are some ways to reduce how much your cheese browns. Get your dough to brown faster by preheating the oven longer and don't forget that the rack with the stone should be set as low as possible. Upgrade from a pizza stone to a pizza steel, which will help your dough brown before the cheese. Try topping your pizza with sauce and baking it halfway, about four minutes. It should be set, but not browned yet. Get it out, sprinkle with cheese and finish baking. Place a second rack in the middle of your oven. Halfway through the bake, place an empty baking sheet onto that middle rack. It will block some of the heat radiating onto your pizza from the top of the oven and will reduce how much your cheese browns. How do I prevent the top of my pizza from being greasy? If you use whole milk mozzarella, it will ooze out some fat by the end of baking, but by the time you slice and serve your pizza, it will reabsorb. So before you grab those paper towels and start mopping up the top of your pizza, give it a couple of minutes of rest and taste it. You just might like it. How do I grill a pizza? My grilling pizza video is in the description below. Keep in mind that it works best on a gas grill because it requires fairly quick heat adjustments that charcoal grills are not very good at. Here are more culinary tutorials for you to check out and the link to my online classes is in the description below.